Hey everyone, Sheehan Jeremy Sipes here with Sheehan Tim Laird. Cheers. And, cheers. <laughs> uh, I need to get me a cup. You always have the cool cups. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure there's coffee in there. Oh yes. Always coffee. Always coffee. <laughs> All right, well welcome to Karate Talk with Sheehan and Sheehan. Uh, today we have a couple of topics that I wanted to talk about today that, um, you know, a lot of times us that are in the martial arts world kind of take for granted because it's a normal thing, um, but I wanted to kind of dive into and explain a little bit more in detail on why we do uh, testing and why we do sparring, and especially here at our schools, um, and what the importance of it is, um, you know, how we go about the process, because there is, it's not just a, you know, uh, we're testing you on this, or go ahead and spar, and there's no rules to it. There's a lot behind it. Um, so I wanted to make sure that, number one, we're able to, you know, give you our idea of where we're standing from and what we think is our best practice. And two, maybe just a little bit of outside looking in information um, on why the process happens in a martial arts school. So let's start with tip testing and belt testing or belt promotion. Uh, some people use different processes, but we do a tip test and then we mm -hmm. do a belt promotion. And it's uh, not that uncommon, but right. still it's, it's, none of these things are universal. There's so many different ways that um, different martial arts schools, systems and styles sort of operate right but there are some things that are fairly common so so tip testing uh, let's uh, break that down a little bit um, the way that we do it uh, how long is somebody testing what can they expect to uh, go through in a tip test maybe um, how many tips do they have to have what what kind of things can people expect in tip testing so tip testing is basically um, you can think of it if we were to sort of an, uh, make an analogy to um, high school or college you can think of it like a midterm Right, it's a, it's a little bit like a, um, a, a halfway point, or in some tire, uh, cases like a two thirds point, right? But it's basically um, every five weeks, that's our, our sort of cycle, um, we're gonna do a test on basically what was learned over that five weeks. And for us, every five week chunk is kind of its own little unit of material, all right? So um, we're taking our students through that, that unit of material, getting them as conversant in it as, as we can make them in that five weeks, and then we sort of um, check the progress. Now, um, for us, it's more of a, we, we test, but in the sense of, of it being a check or a, a tune-up, right? Just like you would take your car into the mechanic every once in a while just to make sure that it's running correctly, right? right? Not to see whether you need a new car or not. <laughs> well, maybe sometimes, but, right? We just want to see, okay, everything's working correctly, and they have, the student has absorbed what we were hoping they would absorb over the cycle. Everything's going well. All right, let's mark that progress. And then, so we're ready to move on to the to the next unit. And speaking of progress, with every tip and every belt, we're always looking for a specific amount of progress. It doesn't mm -hmm. have to be perfection at right, that point right. in time, because if we're looking for perfection all the time, nobody's going to make any progress, <laughs> including ourselves. Right. You know, we have to grade ourselves, and then, uh, you know, under the microscope of all right, where was I at the beginning of this cycle? Where am I now? And is that a, a large enough jump? you know, in comparison on where I need to be. You know, if my sidekick still needs a little bit more work, then I might have to take a couple of extra weeks to, to rep that skill or, you know, get it prepared and then go back to testing, which is another thing that a lot of students, you know, in their span of going to black belt might experience not getting a tip or two. Mm -hmm. um, like me. And, okay. <laughs> I've done that. So talk about that a little bit. Why, why would somebody, uh, what's the benefit of that? You know, us instructors, we don't like not passing a student that's right, not yeah. fun for us but <laughs> it's also have to do it but it's it's not okay or fun for us to pass somebody who's not ready i mean i the main thing i look at is if a student was to ever you know hopefully this never happens but they were to get attacked i want them to be able to utilize the skills and not just think you know i have this color belt around mm -hmm. my waist mm -hmm. it's like okay no i can i can deliver a palm strike or a punch or um, you know, whatever I need to do to get away from that person. I want them to have confidence in that curriculum. So um, can you speak a little bit more on, you know, what we do when it comes to time, you know, somebody's not ready. So somebody's not ready and not ready means that, um, let me go back to the school analogy again. Let's say that I'm in third grade and it, when I was in third grade, I remember that times tables was a big thing. I was learning about <laughs> multiplication. All right, and part of the reason I needed to learn multiplication in the third grade is because it was I was going to be have to use that in fourth grade math when I was starting to learn like division and stuff like that and word problems. Right, my memory's kind of fuzzy. It was back in the days of the dinosaurs, but there were it's a certain skill set that was going to be necessary in order to um, 
be competent in, in the next level. And that's a, that's a big part of it, right? So a big part of testing is we're trying to make sure that students are um, absorbing the skills that they're gonna need to be able to, to participate and gain further competency and um, do what they need to do sort of at the next level. Now, the way that we break it down, uh, we have sort of this rotating curriculum where it's a lot of little chunks that we, we wanna make sure everybody's good at before we move to the next big set of chunks. Right? There's a chunk, set of chunks down here. All right, we need to make sure that they're, they're fairly good at all those chunks and then move over to the next set of chunks and things like that. Right? But the idea is that if I, if I had bombed third grade math, but my teacher said, oh, it's okay, and went ahead and gave me a passing grade, I would have been floundering in fourth grade math. I wouldn't enough. have been ready for it. And that would have been an even worse experience. Right? So when, we're, uh, when we... Uh, um, fail to pass a student, all right? We're, we're not saying that they're a bad student or a bad person, it's just that we're, it's our concern. We think, okay, going ahead, if we allow them to, to continue on from here, bigger problems are gonna happen. So right. we need to sort of make sure that they're, they've got that foundation before they can, they can move on. Right, and I know that we have tip testing going on quite regularly every uh, fourth and fifth week of the cycle. Um, so there's a lot of tools that people can use to be successful. So if you need a private lesson, feel free to reach out to the instructors and we can help you with a game plan if that's needed. Um, another one is, you know, doubling up in classes. We've had lots mm -hmm. of students that get sick or they're injured or they go on vacation or something and, you know, enjoy those vacations. Get better when you're sick, you know, or injured. We want you to, you know, have that, you know, normal life and all that. The dojo is not everything like it is to some people. Um, <laughs> however, uh, if you guys need to double up in classes, you always have that availability. And then the online uh, presence that we have where you can jump on uh, cobars.com uh, slash curriculum and get the password for this cycle's curriculum. It always works for the five weeks that we're working on and you can practice that anywhere. It's mobile friendly, um, but you guys can absolutely use that those tools to be successful. And then we're always here to answer any questions. I've had parents that have uh, videotaped me doing the moves from all different angles so that they can practice it. You know, mm -hmm. and there, there's tools available and be as creative as you need to be, but we're always here to help. Well, there's all kinds of cool things we can do with technology these days that we couldn't do even five, 10, 15 years ago. Absolutely. And uh, it's pretty cool stuff. Yeah, it definitely <laughs> makes it a lot easier, so. All right, that was testing. Let's switch gears really quick. Mm -hmm. I wanna make sure that we have enough time. Uh, let's go on to sparring. So sparring is, uh, I hear, <laughs> A lot of times people hear sparring or I did you know quite a bit of boxing and I know you've done some MMA training and have done a cage fight and uh, have done a lot of Krav Maga and stuff like that which I know is super intense um, and people always have these different ideas about sparring I've heard mm -hmm. that you know it has to be really intense in order to be real you know like basically knockout brawl right, style yeah. and then I've heard that you know on the very flip side of it that people are terrified to get in there because they think it it is always like that you know <laughs> right it's, it's it's kind of funny to hear that there's both sides of it so um can you shed a little bit of light on maybe what you've heard in the past i, I know that you've talked to some really high level individuals and been around a lot of experienced sparrers and uh, people in the industry um, what have they kind of said is is kind of best practice when it comes to sparring? So, and it, this is an interesting question because um, things have changed over the years, right? So there was a time maybe back in say, I don't know, the 60s or 70s, where um, sparring was a little bit hardcore. It was a little bit closer to what some people think it always is, which is basically a knockdown drag out fight that just happens to ha uh, happen inside the dojo, right? Um, rather than uh, out in the street. Um, but even then, it wasn't, wasn't always that way. And as time has uh, progressed and more and more um, research has been done and people have learned from mistakes and the mistakes of others, <laughs> um, even the, everybody, uh, top level guys, people like uh, um, uh, Chuck Liddell's coach, uh, John, John Hackleman, Hackleman yeah. right? Um, people like uh, Chris Rappold, who's, who's a, a champion uh, point fighter and uh, has coached many champion point fighters. Uh, people like uh, Mark Delagrati and our friend Patrick Rivera, right? These guys are, are coaching people that are, are winning fights, um, but even then they're thinking, okay, 30% roughly is, and that's kind of the, the, the agreement across the board. If we're going about 30% speed and we're still making light contact, that's sufficient for gaining of skill for gaining of the comfort level of being in that, that sort of situation that is like reality but isn't quite reality. 
Um, and more and more people are leaning on more drills, which are a little bit more scripted, a little bit more uh, rules to them as to how you can apply them rather than what we'd call free sparring, which is we put the gloves on, we put the gear on, and we just kind of kind of go for it, even if we're going uh, lightly. So everything has its place, but sparring is one of those things where it's always been, like a lot of training elements, uh, a balance between reality and safety. Right. Um, uh, the Krav Maga founder, Emi Lichtenfeld, once famously said, you can't send a soldier into battle injured, right? So our training methods need to keep people safe so that when the time comes, if they have to use the skills that they've been training on, they can use them to their full functionality because right. they're not hurt, yeah. right? No. So well, there's always this balance, but um, it doesn't need to be hardcore in order to be useful. And in fact, it's probably better if it's not. Yeah. It, it's funny, all these analogies are popping up in my head, so I'm yeah. thinking about like a teenager when they first learn how to drive. You're not just sending them out on the freeway. You know, mm -hmm. that's, that's your 100%. That's you know, all the way, go for it. Right. You put them in some driving courses, you take them to the parking lot, you have right. them try a couple of parking spaces. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of times people think that 30% has to be wimpy. It's, it's not. Like You can still right. follow through with techniques and still mentally be uh, on top of your game and and 30 you getting hit 30 percent when you don't know what's coming it hurts it doesn't feel good right it's still not so, pleasant yeah so <laughs> if you're if you're sparring right then you're looking for openings and you're being crafty and you're and you're trying to really perfect your skill rather than just trying to to drive everything home as hard as you can and i've been mm -hmm. i've been through plenty of those sparring matches and at the time i thought i was having fun but looking back on it like i don't I don't like sparring like that anymore. It's, <laughs> it's not fun. Yeah. Like I, I got gotten hit a lot, and I've hit people hard, and I never feel good about it afterwards. You know, right? I yeah. Remember catching one of my good friends with a liver shot, and he just dropped instantly, and I felt horrible. Like, <laughs> right. man, like I wasn't in a competition. I wasn't trying to, you know, win a fight or anything. We were just sparring, and you know, it was kind of one of those times where I thought, okay, well, maybe we should back it off a little bit and and play a little bit nicer. Let's learn from this experience and. Um, honestly, I found that when I drill, I have such a harder time keeping up with the pace than I do when I free spar. Because when I free spar, I kind of do what I like and oh, right. I'm able to uh -huh. coast and uh, kind of be complacent. You know, those drills force me outside my comfort zone and sometimes I get a little more tired than I want to. But, um, <laughs> but also, you're, you're learning, right? Absolutely. And that's, I think that um, that's, that's where that difference is, is that when I'm coasting and kind of relaxing, I'm not learning because I'm not pushing myself. I'm not, mm -hmm. okay, my body needs to turn this way or, you know, recover this right, way, or, right. oh, I need to learn how to breathe through this technique. Um, and those are the things we can think about when doing it 30% because you can still get tired. You can still get a good workout and all that stuff and not have to go a hundred percent the whole time. And, and then, and then you get, don't get hurt. <laughs> right. Know? Yeah. Then you have friends to spar with. I always remember my dad saying, you know, we want to live to play another day. That was, mm -hmm. <laughs> that was kind of always, always his line, which is, you know, definitely a good thing to think about. Right. And, uh, I want to address one more thing. Did, I mean, everybody understands that in any athletic, uh, endeavor like sparring, there's always that slight risk of injury, but we're going to take the precautions that we need to, um, like the gear, right? To make sure that it's as safe as possible. And some people might ask, well, if there's there's all these risks involved, it's all this this trouble, you gotta do all this stuff just to just to participate. Why do it at all? Well, here's the thing, is nothing is as uh spon nothing is scripted in reality, and nothing is gonna get as close to reality as something spontaneous like a sparring match. Spon spontaneity meaning that n nobody knows what's exactly what's gonna happen next, right? And being able to mentally deal with that situation that understanding that I don't know what's going to happen but I've got to keep my my eyes on I got to keep uh, my head in the game I've got to stay calm under this the kind of stressful situation that's incredibly valuable and you're not going to get that from scripted routines which have their own use right those scripted routines are very very valuable for right. um, pro, uh, programming muscle memory and uh, technical issues and making people you know uh, baby steps comfortable with some movements but nothing is going to get that like something spontaneous like sparring um, so it's it's an incredibly valuable part of not just self defense, but being able to stay calm in the pocket, so to speak, right? When maybe you're you're not having a good day and your opponent is really getting the better of you, but you're you're staying calm, you're breathing, you're recognizing, okay, this sucks, but I'm gonna get through it, yeah. <laughs> right? Just like you're in a, a job interview that's not going well, and you can think back, okay, I, I I know this feeling, right? I'm bombing, it sucks, but you know what? I'm gonna get through it. I'm gonna be okay, right? That is incredibly valuable. Absolutely.
a lot of life skills that are parallels to that. Mm -hmm. Being able to just be calm under pressure is huge. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, whether it's a driving situation, whether it's interviewing, whether it's, you know, you see a crisis that's going down, how to react to it instead of just flying off the handle or cowering down. Right, know? right. Having that Having confidence. an intelligent reaction rather than just giving in to instincts, yeah. fight or flight or freeze. Yeah, I don't, <laughs> and there's been plenty of times where, you know, whether in jiu-jitsu, so I know that my stand-up, I'm much more comfortable than I am in jiu-jitsu. But when I Same. when I <laughs> when I am going against like a white belt or a blue belt or somebody under that rank, I feel okay. But as soon as somebody that's like you know brown or black belt is like full on attack mode, I feel like just curling up and just <laughs> cowering down, and I hate that feeling because you know I, I need to train out of that. But mm -hmm. um, that's only the, those repetitions that you talk about being in that spontaneous time frame multiple mm -hmm. times over and over and over yeah. again and just getting practice at being uncomfortable which is a lot of fun but, uh, <laughs> it is a lot yeah. of fun it, Valuable, it, it does it does sound silly sometimes that you know we fight each other so that we can be more confident and comfortable fighting um, but you know that's that's what we're practicing for is so that if ever we had to defend ourselves at a hundred percent then mm -hmm. hopefully some of those skills are gonna kick in and we're gonna be able to get out of there with our our safety whether it's ours or our family or friends or whoever we're trying to take care of at that point in time so mm -hmm. anyways um thanks shihan uh, i think that's probably our time uh it's always fun talking with you about Absolutely. this stuff uh so that was tip testing and belt promotions and why we do our sparring um just want to make sure you guys like and subscribe our youtube channel um please visit and uh let us know what you guys think leave us some comments below on topics that maybe you want to hear about in the future um, I'm thinking maybe soon uh, we might be doing a uh, questionnaire because uh, we've been doing it in class lately and having some fun with it. Uh, so if there's <laughs> like uh, some fun random facts that you want to know about the instructors, uh, let us know. We might even put some questions in there from the other ones. But mm -hmm. uh, once again, please like and subscribe. Check us out next week. And uh, thanks uh, for tuning in to Karate Talk with Shihan and Shihan. Catch you guys later.